All right, sorry for the hold up. Um, before we embark on this exciting and long overdue project that we have collectively gathered to bring to fruition, let us begin by acknowledging that we occupy stolen lands. The land I'm calling in from today historically belonged to the Wabanaki Confederacy, to the speakers of the Abenaki language, and is now referred to as Hanover, New Hampshire. Please refer to the link in the chat to take a moment to reflect on where you're joining us from today. As we recognize past harms, let us also resolve to leave more equitable and humane futures behind us. Hi everyone, my name is Vasiki Chauhan and I'm a graduate student at Dartmouth College. On behalf of all the students and postdocs on the organizing committee, I'd love to warmly welcome you all to the first talk in the Innovators in Cognitive Neuroscience series. Collectively, we represent a consortium of schools, Dartmouth, Harvard, UPenn, Yale, Princeton, and MIT, devoted to highlighting innovative advances in cognitive neuroscience. We acknowledge that these schools are elite institutes of higher learning and to de-silo the generation of knowledge within the ivory tower. We plan to make these talks publicly available with the consent of the speakers and with closed captions on the website for this talk series and on the website for Center for Cognitive Neuroscience at Dartmouth College. And I'm gonna hand it over to Sasha to introduce this talk series. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sasha Britsky and I'm also a graduate student at Dartmouth College. Um, and so this series, The Innovators in Cognitive Neuroscience, recognizes outstanding research conducted by historically underrepresented groups in cognitive neuroscience and related fields, including women, BIPOC, LGBTQ+, and differently abled individuals. And I just want to acknowledge um, that we have not made our live talk fully accessible today to those who are hearing impaired, as was uh, generously pointed out to us and so we apologize for this and like Fasiki said we will provide closed captions for this recorded talk and we will work for we we're working with accessibility services to provide closed captions um, live closed captions for future talks in this series um, and so we also recognize that often our work does not directly address um, social issues impacting minoritized groups in society at large and so to put the innovative in the ICN, we have asked all of our speakers to nominate a charity of their choice. Um, as you can see on this uh, screen right here, what um, our charity this week is supporting transgender equality. And we ask that everyone who's attending this talk considers donating to this charity if they're able to today. And together, we hope that we can bridge our science to the myriad of pressing social issues that are entrenched in our society. And I'd like to just close by especially recognizing Jim Haxby, who has generously provided the funding for this series through Dartmouth's um, Center for Cognitive Neuroscience, and to Courtney Rogers, who has done a tremendous job in helping to organize the series and bringing it to fruition. And on that note, I'll pass things over to Jenny, who will introduce our speaker today, Dr. Danielle Bassett. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Jenny Ciso. I am a grad student in Danny's lab, and I am super excited to get to introduce her today. Danny got her PhD in physics from the University of Cambridge, working with Ed Bulmore and Thomas Duke before moving on to a postdoc um, with Jean Carlson at UC Santa Barbara. In 2013, she started her lab at Penn, where she is now a full professor. And her lab has tackled a lot of really interesting problems. I think it's difficult to summarize all of the work in one sentence, but I think some of the most innovative work the lab has done in cognitive neuroscience has brought theories and tools from physics and engineering, to you know, these questions about trying to understand the brain and behavior. And she, um, Danny has had tons and tons of awards uh, recognizing her for this work, um, including the MacArthur Grant. And more recently, Danny has started to use her voice to advocate for diversity and equity in STEM and academia, which is gonna be the focus of the talk today. And on top of all of these really amazing scientific contributions, I can also say that Danny is a really fantastic mentor and a really great advocate for all of her students. And with that, I will um, hand it over to Danny so we can get the talk started. Thank you so much, Jenny. And um, thank you for everybody else for organizing this um, series. Um, it says that I can't share the screen while other participants are presenting or are sharing. So maybe if whoever has that slide pulls it down, that might help. Great. Let's see if this works. <laughs> 
Yes. Okay. So I am giving the talk today in support for the National Center for Transgender Equality. And so I wanted to just take a moment um, to tell you why, and then I'll get to the um, scientific portion of the talk. So transgender people are people whose gender identity is different from the gender they were thought to be at birth. Transgender people make up 0.5 to 0.6% of the US population, so about 1.4 million adults, relatively consistently across age groups. So 0.66% in 18 to 24 year olds, 0.58% um, in 25 to 64 year olds, and 0.5% of people 65 years of age and older. I've highlighted four different transgender um, scientists in academia on the left-hand side here, Professor Ben, ben Bars, transgender man, neuroscientist at Stanford University, um, recently deceased, Dr. Lynn Conway, transgender woman, computer scientist and engineer at IBM. Um, Dr. Izzy, transgender woman, biotechnologist at University of Sheffield, and Professor Andrew Perfors, transgender man, cognitive scientist at U Melbourne. Just a few to give you some of the faces that you may see in the future. And um, the reason that I wanted to uh, devote this talk in support of the National Center for Transgender Equality is that transgender people um, face pervasive mistreatment and violence. 54% of K through 12 transgender children and youth were verbally harassed in the past year. So this is a 2017 um, uh, documentary or survey because they were transgender. 24% were physically attacked, 13% were sexually assaulted, 17% experienced such severe mistreatment that they left a school. 10% of those who were out to their immediate family experienced violence from a family member because they were transgender. of adults reported being fired, denied promotion, or experiencing some form of mistreatment in the workplace due to their gender identity or expression. In the year prior to the survey, 46% were verbally harassed, 9% were physically attacked because of being transgender. In that same period, 10% were sexually assaulted and nearly half, so 47% were sexually assaulted at some point in their lifetime. The majority of transgender people who are murdered are black women. Transgender people also experience severe economic hardship um, and instability. Nearly one third, so 29% of respondents were living in poverty compared to 12% in the US population, so almost three times the amount of the average in the US population. A major contributor to the high rate of poverty is likely respondents 50% unemployment rate, three times higher than the unemployment rate in the US population at the time of the survey, which was 5%. Respondents were also far less likely to own a home, with only 16% of respondents reporting home ownership, compared to 63% of the US population. Even more concerning, nearly one third, so 30% of respondents, have experienced homelessness at some point in their life, and 12% reported experiencing homelessness in the year prior to completing the survey because they were transgender. Third, transgender people experience harmful effects on physical and mental health. A staggering 39% of respondents experienced serious psychological distress in the month prior to completing the survey, compared with only 5% of the US population. So that's an eight-fold difference. Among the starkest findings is that 40% of respondents have attempted suicide in their lifetime, nearly nine times the attempted suicide rate in the US population, which is 4.6%. Respondents also encountered high levels of mistreatment when seeking health care. In the year prior to completing the survey, one third, so 33% of those who saw a health care provider, had at least one negative experience related to being transgender, such as being verbally harassed or refused treatment because of their gender identity. Additionally, nearly one quarter, so 23% of respondents, reported that they did not seek the health care they needed in the year prior to completing the survey due to fear of being mistreated as a transgender person and 33% did not go to a healthcare provider when needed because they could not afford it. The National Center for Transgender Equality is devoted to changing laws, policies, resources, and society to improve trans people's lives. It offers efforts at the national level uh, to fight back um, in inappropriate legislation that discriminates against transgender people. It has actions at the state level in healthcare devoted legislation. There are also efforts just to raise the voices um, of people who are transgender and provide support for families that have transgender children. There are also significant efforts in schools, local schools, to fight for respectful policies for the children who attend them. So with these um, with the important efforts that the National Center for Transgender Equality pursues, I would encourage you to donate um, for in support of this talk. 
So with that, I'd like to move on to the science. And I've titled this talk, Inciting Action to Realize an Equitable Future. And, and the um, first word is kind of a play on words because we're going to be talking about uh, citations. And I'll tell you a little bit more, more about that as we go on. But first, what I wanted to do was to read to you this passage from Benson's Rossetti. So he, Benson is one of my favorite um, biographers, and he wrote a biography of Rossetti. And he says, we find such lines in Rossetti as the unfettered irreversible goal, or sleepless with cold commemorative eyes. Note such textures as, oh, what is this that knows the road I came? The flame turned cloud, the cloud returned to flame, the lifted, shifted steeps in all the way that draws round me at last this wind-warm space, and in regenerate rapture turns my face upon the devious covers of dismay. Or, and he quotes Rosetti again, ah, who shall dare to search through what sad maze thenceforth their incommunicable ways follow the desultory feed of death? And now Benson is speaking again. It will be observed in these last quotations, there is a certain slight shifting of the usual meaning of words like commemorative, regenerate, and incommunicable. Some slight nuance added to them, which is not found in ordinary speech. This preciosity has a charm of its own and upon this handling of language, this delicate straining of the use of words depends much of the pleasure derivable from the works of masters of elaborate style. So I like this passage because it suggests to me that words that we use can be stretched in their meaning. They can change their meaning, they can reconfigure their meaning. Maybe there's some amount of energy that's required to allow them to change that meaning. So imagine there's a word that's being trans stretched or flexed to another word. There's some amount of energy that's required to do that. And then that word may be stretched in a new meaning direction. And there's some amount of energy that's required to do that. And again, and I think this notion of words stretching their meaning makes me think about what are the drivers of change in meaning and change in concept? What factors can and do drive changes in meaning and concept? Well, certainly, as, as shown in the Benson passage, just a short section of a book or a short section of an essay can push or pull the meaning of words just by the words right around it, right? But that happens over very short periods of time. There are also ways that meaning can change over for longer periods of time in, for example, a book. I highly recommend Ben Barr's autobiography. Fantastic work that really stretches the mind in terms of the meaning that has been associated with specific concepts. And then culture can also change the meaning of words. And in particular, I really enjoy Cultures Without Culturalism, The Making of Scientific Knowledge, which is by Kareem Chalma and Evelyn Fox Keller. So across these three instances, earlier sense of not appropriate to the situation. And in science, I want to give you an example of not a word that's, whose meaning has changed, but a word whose meaning needs to change. And that is the meaning of the word scientist. In our popular conception, the word scientist has the meaning of appearing masculine. So there's this wonderful paper from in 2016 from Benchevsky et al. that um, showed pictures of actual faculty members in STEM at elite universities to a set of participants. Those participants rated the pictures in terms of masculinity and femininity. Then a separate group of participants was asked to rate the likelihood of the, the person being a scientist. The participants assumed that feminine looking women were early childhood educators, whereas more masculine looking women were, were more likely to be scientists. That same um, variation across the masculinity femini femininity spectrum and its relationship to career was not found in the man images categories. Now the meaning of a scientist is not just appears masculine, but also is a man. So, um, in this paper from Nature Geoscience in 2019 from Dutt et al., uh, there were 1,224 letters that were considered. They were written for 452 applicants, averaging about 2.71 letters per applicant, by 1,101 recommenders from 54 countries over the period 2007 to 2012. What they found is that the woman applicant was only half as likely to receive excellent letters versus good letters. Man applicants were rated as brilliant, rising stars, pioneers, geniuses, and trailblazers, and women applicants were described as having a solid skill set, a good track record, strong knowledge, have, being intelligent, and having an aptitude for learning. Finally, scientists, the meaning of the word scientist doesn't just connote an appearance of masculinity or being a man themselves, but also having a man-gendered name. 
In a randomized double-blind st study of N equals 127 physics, biology, and chemistry faculty from research-intensive universities, they rated the application materials of a student who was randomly assigned a name, commonly given to either a man or a woman, for a laboratory manager position. If the application was assigned a woman's name, it was deemed less competent, less hireable, offered less mentoring, and offered $3,700 less in salary than an identical application that was assigned a man's name. I want you to note that this is not the privilege of a name, or this is not the privilege of a gender. This is the privilege of a name alone. And with that, I think we need to broaden out these three studies are only a few of the many that I could have brought to you today, indicating the meaning of the word scientist to us as a group, as a populace. Prior work has reported gender and also racial inequalities in academia and industry that clearly support those previous studies. There is reported um, gender and racial inequalities in compensation, in grant funding, in credit for collaborative work, in teaching evaluations, hiring and promotions, productivity and authorship, and citations. What's really interesting about the conversation about gender and racial inequalities in academia and industry is that that conversation still focuses largely on the role of people in positions of power. So journal editors, grant reviewers and agencies, department chairs and society presidents, despite the fact that many imbalances are caused and perpetuated by researchers at all levels, including you and me. One particular example of those inequalities that are perpetuated by us is the problem of citations. People from marginalized groups are broadly undersighted by everyone, impacting visibility, slowing or stalling career advancement, and precluding an unbiased trajectory in the search for scientific truth. There's clear evidence in the scientific literature that we choose new research directions from highly cited papers. There's also clear evidence that papers written by men are cited to assign the term man or woman to each name if that name had a probability greater than or equal to 0.7 of belonging to someone labeled as man or woman according to the Social Security Administration database or to in the gender API. And here I want to be very clear in the distinction between sex and gender. The way that we're using the term gender does not relate to the sex of the author. So when I say the gender of this person, I do not refer to any of their sexual physiological characteristics as assigned at birth or as chosen leader. The term gender that as I am using it also does not directly refer to the gender of the author as socially assigned or as self-chosen. When I use the term gender in this study, we are referring to the probability of a name being used by a man or a woman. Second, I want to underscore a significant limitation of the work I'm about to show you, and that is that we are using a man-woman binary gender assignment, and this is not well accommodated to intersex, transgender, and or non-binary identities. We are engaging in ongoing and future work to address this limitation. Now, just to set the stage, if we take all of those 61,000 some articles uh, across the five top neuroscience journals, which are Nature Neuroscience, Neuron, Journal of Neuroscience, NeuroImage, and Brain, here you can see the proportion of papers that were written um, by having a man first and last author uh, in 1995, so about 64%, and then up through 2018, so you can see it's about 50% in 2018. You can also see the number of papers that are written by mixed teams, so woman first author, man last author, or man first author and woman last author. And finally, you can see the number of papers that were written with the first um, author woman and a last author woman, started at 7% in 1995 and is up to about 10% in 2018. That's an increase of roughly 0.6% per year. In this data set, we first wanted to test the hypothesis that had been motivated by prior work in the literature, do we see an undercitation of women? To address that hypothesis, for each of 31,418 citing papers between 2009 and 2018, we took the subset of its citations that had been published in one of the, uh, those five journals since 1995, and we determined the gender of the citing first and last author. We also removed self-citations, uh, which we defined as cited papers for which either the first or last author of the citing paper was the first or last author. And that helped us to really evaluate how each author was canvassing the field, not canvassing themselves. Although in the supplement, we do report um, the effects of self-citations. <laughs> 
Uh, finally, we calculated the number of cited papers that fell into each of the four first author and last author categories. So man, man is, I'll refer to as MM, woman, man is WM, man, woman would be MW, and then woman, woman, I'll refer to as WW. So next we need to estimate over and under citation. What, how can we quantify whether or not one group is being oversighted or undersighted? Now a natural place to start would just be to assume that when we um, construct our reference lists, we're taking a random draw from the literature and therefore we're more likely to be citing men because there are more men-led papers and we're less likely to be citing women because there are fewer um, papers written by win women. So to sort of implement that random draws ap approach. What we did is that we calculated the gender proportion among all papers published prior to the citing paper, thus representing the proportion among the pool of papers that the authors could have cited and multiplied them by the number of papers cited. So here you can see the results, the percent over and under citation. If a value is close to zero, that means that you're citing in proportion to what's in the field. So you'll have more citations um, to uh, papers that have a man first author and man last author just because that's the proportion in the field. If you're above zero, that means that you're citing those kinds of papers more than expected given their proportion in the field. And if you're under zero, it means that you're citing those papers less than expected given their proportion in the field. We define this over and under citation as the observed percent minus the expected percent and then divided by the expected percent. What we found is that man-man papers were oversighted by 11.6%, woman-man papers were undersighted by 10%, man-woman papers were undersighted by 12.5%, and woman-woman papers were undersighted by 30.2%. So it's sort of a whopping one there. Now, you might say that when you cite, <clears throat> when you construct your reference list, you don't necessarily take a random draw of papers um, and stick it in your reference list. Maybe there are some other reasons that you would cite a paper, and we completely acknowledge that. So in our next null model to estimate over and under citation, we included several important paper characteristics that we thought were very relevant to the expected citations. That includes the year of the publication, the journal in which it was published, so we know that the impact factor of the journal can affect whether or not that paper will be highly cited or less highly cited. Number three, the number of authors on the paper. Number four, whether the paper was a review article, they tend to be cited more, than empirical article. And five, the seniority of the paper's first and last authors. Now we don't know the age of the people in this group. Uh, so as a proxy for seniority, we counted the number of papers that they had previously published. And so we use their number of papers as a proxy for their seniority. Here you can see the percent over and under citation under this relevant characteristics model. What you can see is that man man papers are oversighted by 5.2%. Women man papers are undersighted by 6.7%, man woman papers are undersighted by 4.6%, and women women papers are undersighted by 13.9%. So you can see the overall trends still hold, although they are not as marked as they were in the random draws model. Now, the second hypothesis that we wanted to test is that the under citation of the minority is driven by the majority. And again, that's motivated by prior work that I don't have enough time to get into today. But what we did is that we separated out all of the papers that are written by a man first author and a man last author, and the papers that have a woman in either the first and last author position. And we just show their citation practices. So here are the citation practices of the man-man teams. And what you can see is that there's a consistent over-citation of men, a consistent under-citation of women-women papers. If you look at the papers that have a woman as a first or last author and look at who they cite, they cite much more equitably across um, the groups. In fact, in this case, they are over-citing the man-man papers by 2.5%. They're under-citing women-women papers by 4.2%. So this suggests that the imbalance is largely driven by the citation practices of the man-man teams. Now, I want to note a few points on logic. Number one, the fact that the imbalance is driven largely by the citation practices of man-man teams does not mean that all men-led teams have imbalanced citation practices. And I want to highlight the citation practices of Professor, um, a professor Emeritus at KU Leuven, Guy Urban, who uh, cites actually in complete opposite uh, trend 
and to what is expected. So he tends to undersight man-man papers and significantly oversight women-women papers. So that's just an indication that you can find a man-led team or even just a single person that cites either equitably or inequitably and either in the direction against the minority or in the direction for the minority. The second part of logic that I want to clarify is that the fact that women teams are not driving the imbalance doesn't mean that all women-led teams have balanced citation practices. So I asked Jordan to check my citation practices and it's not something that I'm particularly proud of. So you can see that I do oversight uh, the man-man papers a bit, but I heavily undersight women-women papers. In fact, more than is expected in the general um, uh, populace of this data set. So that's not something that was good to see, but it is something that I can change with every paper that I write in the future. Lastly, we wanted to test hypothesis three, which is that we thought that this imbalance should be decreasing over time because we know that the number of papers that are written by uh, the gender minority, which in this case is women, are increasing with time. So we thought, well, with more papers written by women, hopefully the imbalance is decreasing with time. But we actually find the complete opposite. So we find that the imbalance within reference lists is increasing with time not decreasing. And we can see that that's largely being driven by the citation practices of man-man teams. So this is the man-man uh, team set data, part of the data set. Here's the percent over and under citation. So you can see that those teams tend to oversight uh, other man-man papers at an increasing rate with time. And you can see that they are undersighting the women-women papers at an increasing rate with time. So that the gap in the citation imbalance that is occurring in 2018 is markedly larger than what it was in 1995. If you look at the teams that have a woman in the first or last author position, what you can see is that there is a slight trend upwards, um, but not to the degree that you observe in the man-man teams. In the man-man teams, the rate uh, is increasing at 0.54 percentage points per year, while in the uh, reference lists that have a woman in the first or last author position, that rate is 0.29 percentage points per year. The last question that we had was, what is the impact of social networks? So there has been prior work uh, that's shown that researchers are more likely to work with other researchers of their own gender, and such homophily and co-authorship networks can produce biased perceptions of the overall gender makeup of a network. So we quantified two different measurements of the social network, man-author overrepresentation and man-man paper overrepresentation. I'm not going to get into the details of these due to time because I want to move on to the next section of the talk, but just to show that if you account for that social uh, network homophily in the, in the co-authorship, we do not fully explain the over-citation of um, the man-man papers. So this empty spot between the color bars, color bars are what's explained by the social network, and then the empty spots parts are what's not explained by the social network. And what we find, therefore, since there is this empty area, that local homophily explains only part of the over-citation of men by other men. Now, I want to pause here for some explanations and some non-explanations. What do these data show? The under-citation of women in neuroscience papers may be due to systemic gender bias or to explicit or implicit individual bias relative either to the known gender of an author or to an author's gendered name. The same is true for race and ethnicity. Overrepresentation of men in course syllabi and conference speaking roles is clearly a factor in gender, racial, and ethnic disparity in academia, but this mechanism does not explain the fact that overcitation of the majority is largely driven by the majority themselves, not by everyone. The growing gender gap, and I'll show you race and ethnicity next, does not simply reflect authors' propensity to cite older literature from when the field was more majority dominated, as the expected proportions account for the publication year of the article being cited. And lastly, the findings are not explained by self-citations self driven by a man-dominated subfield or driven largely by a few high-impact papers rather than being a systemic effect across papers of all impact levels. And you can see the supplement of the paper for evidence in favor of those three claims. The community's response to this paper has been um, overwhelmingly um, positive and, and I don't know, they've been acknowledging uh, that this is happening. So there was a very fascinating and supportive brain editorial in 2020. Um, there was an editorial from the Nature Neuroscience Editors called Widening the Scope of Diversity. There was a wonderful perspective from Adrian Fairhall and Eve Martel, Martyr called Acknowledging Female Voices. 
Um, there's also been a generalization to Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience. It's titled Gender Imbalance and Citation Practices in Cognitive Neuroscience. Um, and that's on the bioarchive, so you can check that out. There's also been an editorial in Nature Reviews Physics called The Growing Citation Gap. So what I want to ask the question of, is this, you know, I started by saying that there was both gender and racial or ethnic disparities in academia, and I really just talked about gender so far. And what we wanted to do next was to ask about other dimensions of discrimination. Is this something specific to gender, or is it generalizable across other dimensions of difference? To answer that question, we expanded the study to consider the race and ethnicity of the authors that are being cited in this group. So to assign author race, what we did is that we used a publicly available probabilistic database and a deep neural network that learns the relationships between names and racial or ethnic categories on Wikipedia entries. The approach allows us to estimate the probability distribution across four different racial categories, Asian, Black, Hispanic, and White, based on each author's first and last names. What we did is that we expanded the data set uh, to 2019, and so now we have 63,677 articles. We found that the proportion of articles with a person of color as first or last author significantly increased between 1995 and 2019 at a rate of approximately 0.97% uh, per year. So you can see that in dark blue, we have white author, white author papers, so first and last. And in this burnt orange, we have author of color, author of color, so first and last. And then in the greens, we have the mixed categories. Now let's ask the same kinds of questions. Um, is there evidence for over or under citation of authors of color in the random draws model. So that's when we just take account of the actual proportions that are in the field and ask if you cite according to those proportions, are your reference lists kind of consistent with existing proportions or skewed in comparison to existing proportions. On the left hand side, I'm showing you the data for all citers. So here you can see the percent over and under citation to papers that have a white first and last author up through papers that have a author of color in the first and last author position. In the light uh, color violins, you see the null model. And then in the darker colors, you see the actual data. So what you can see here is that all citers tend to oversight papers that have a white author in the first and last author positions by 7.1%. They tend to undersight papers that have an author of color in the first and last author position, and that's by 17.3%. Now you can separate that data into just the white ciders or the ciders of color. And what you can see is that white ciders oversight other papers by white people by 13% compared to the 7%, so almost twice as much as what we saw in the uh, complete data set. And they undersight papers written by an author of color in both the first and last author positions by 32.7%. The citers of color, on the other hand, are citing relatively equitably. So you can see that they're roughly citing according to the proportions that are in the field. Now we can ask about the relevant characteristics models. So not just did they you know, randomly draw um, papers from the literature, but did they, are we, if we account for some characteristics of a paper that may be relevant for citations, do we still see this imbalance? The answer is yes. In this case, what we did is that we uh, used the year of publication, the journal of publication, the number of authors, the research article or review criteria, first and last author seniority, and the location of the author's institutions. And again, here is the data for all citers on the left-hand side here. So you can see that, um, all citers tend to oversight papers with a white first and last author by 5% and tend to undersight the papers with authors of color in the first and last author position by 7.6%. On the right hand side, you can see the difference in the citation practices of white people and the citation practices of citers of color. You can see that the majority of the imbalance is being driven by white citers. So they oversight other white papers by 9.2% and they undersight papers with an author of color in both positions at a, at a degree of 19.6%. Now, is the racial and ethnic imbalance in citations decreasing in time as we would hope given the fact that there are more papers written by racial and ethnic minorities? The answer is again a depressing no. It's actually increasing with time, not decreasing. So here I've separated the data out by white citers and citers of color. What you can see is that white citers are oversighting papers written by a white first and last author at an increasing rate 
over time, and they're underciting papers with an author of color in both position at a, at a rate that's decreasing with time. So the gap between the citations that are given to papers with white people and papers with authors of color is widening, not closing. And you can see the practices of citers of color on the right-hand side. What you can see is that they tend to cite much more closely to the zero line, which is the dashed uh, gray mark. There is a slight increasing over-citation of white people in this purple line here, um, but it's a much um, slower trend than it is in the uh, white citers. They also do not tend to, un they're not changing in their citation of other, cit other authors of color with time. There are some partial explanations for these findings from co-authorship networks. So we do find that racial and ethnic segregation in co-authorship networks is increasing with time despite greater field-wide collaboration. So that suggests that authors of color are more and more working with other authors of color um, in, their co in, a, in building the new co-authorship networks. And white people are more and more working with other white people in building the emerging co-authorship networks. We also find that the most imbalanced white ciders tend to cite more locally within the co-authorship network than the least imbalanced white ciders. So they're really citing more of their academic friends or siblings um, rather than canvassing the field equitably. And the most imbalanced ciders of color utilized unexpectedly long paths to reach white authors, passing over authors of color close to them. So this does suggest that co-authorship um, explains some of the citation practices of both um, white citers and citers of color. Now the last question, sort of data question that we had was what about intersectionality? Um, what is the cost that is paid by someone who is an author of color and is also a woman? So here what you see in color is the percent over and under citation. And then along the um, x-axis is the last author's race or ethnicity and gender, so men first and then women, sec women second. And then along the y-axis, you see the first author's race and ethnicity, men first and then women second. What you can see by looking at this is that the first principal component of this matrix is a component of gender. So on average, papers that have a man first and last author are undersighted, independent of their race or ethnicity. And on average, papers that have a woman in the first and last author position are undersighted hugely um, independent of their race and ethnicity. Now, after you take uh, into account the first principal component of gender, then we see variation according to race. So within the man-man block, what you see is that papers that have a white man as first and last author are oversighted much more than a paper that has a black man as a first and last author, which is oversighted by 1%, which is not huge. It's almost sort of at the equitable line. And then here, what you see in the papers um, that have a woman as first and last author, that the largest, the, the sort of largest cost is paid by Hispanic women and Black women. And again, remember that these effects are largely driven by the majority race, which is white, and the majority gender, which is man. And they're increasing with time, not decreasing. So the big question is, where do we go from here? And I think we need to um, very carefully grapple with what are the ethics of citation practices. And I will be the first to acknowledge that the ethics of citation practices remain to be further refined. Um, writing social inequalities can be accomplished under a couple different ethical models, and I want to talk about at least two of them. The first one is the distributional model. So in this model, justice refers to the morally proper distribution of social goods and resources, or in this case, citations. And on the equality-based distributed model, citations ought to be allocated to all authors equally, while on the equity-based distributed model, citations ought to be allocated to authors differentially based on select factors, which might include merit or need or authority. I will note that the distributional model is severely limited, in my opinion, by emphasizing commodity parity over, uh, across economies of exchange, over differential responsibilities for the histories and structures of inequality. I therefore am more supportive of difference models of ethics, which by contrast recommend acts of reparative justice, which might include affirmative action in citation practices, institutional reform to support citation parity, and disciplinary redress of gender bias and racial ethnic bias more broadly. <laughs> 
Now, let's ask, you know, once we have defined what the ethics is here, what are some concrete recommendations? Well, we wrote a paper that was recently published in Neuron that is more of a perspective piece um, on the work rather than an empirical piece. And in that, we create some recommendations for um, creators of science, arbiters of science, and reflectors of science. For the creators of science, those are producers, generators, authors, designers, and originators of manuscripts. So they could be undergrads, research assistants, grad students, postdocs, research staff, or PIs. In this group, ask yourself whether your reference lists are balanced. Educate yourself on the work of minority scientists. Gather information about the current gender, race, and ethnicity distribution of authors in your field. Determine whether you aim to reflect that current distribution or to proactively cite more work by minority scientists as an act of reparative justice and affirmative action in citation practices. Number five, five, consider appending a citation diversity statement to your paper. What is a citation diversity statement? A citation diversity statement looks like this, and we have another paper um, with Nicole Rust in 2020 in Trends in Cognitive Science, which describes what a citation diversity statement is and how you might go about creating your own. Here's an example of what one might look like, and it moves from motivation to method to result to limitations. It reads like this, recent work in several fields of science has identified a bias in citation practices such that papers from women and other minority scholars are undersighted relative to the number of such papers in the field. Here we sought to proactively consider choosing references that reflect the diversity of the field in thought, form of contribution, gender, race, ethnicity, and other factors. First, we obtain the predicted gender of the first and last author of each reference by using databases that store the probability of a first name being carried by a woman. By this measure, and excluding self-citations to the first and last authors of our current study, our references contain A% woman woman, B% man woman, C% man woman man, and D% man man, or E% unknown. This method is limited in that A, names, pronouns and social media profiles used to construct the da databases may not in every case be indicative of gender identity. And B, it cannot account for intersex, non-binary and transgender people. Second, we obtain predicted racial and ethnic category of the first and last author of, our, of each reference by databases that store the probability of a first and last name being carried by an author of color. By this measure, and again excluding self-citations, our reference lists contain F% percent author of color, author of color, up through I% percent white author, white author. The method is limited in that A, names, census entries, and Wikipedia profiles used to make the predictions may not be indicative of racial ethnic identity, and B, it cannot account for indigenous and mixed race authors and or those who may face differential biases due to the ambiguous racialization or ethnicization of their names. We look forward to future work that could help us to better understand how to support equitable practices in science. Why add something like this to your papers? Well, number one, it holds us accountable. Number two, it increases global awareness of citation imbalance. And number three, you can point future readers to relevant tools for mitigating disparity. Now, that's if you're a creator and you actually have a paper. What if you don't have a paper yet? So that, in that case, you may think about the, your um, uh, responsibilities and potentiality. So six, proactively consider fleshing out ideas from minority scholars early in the problem formulation stage so that the work of minority thinkers is in fact central to your questions, not an afterthought. What about arbiters? So these are mediators, moderators, and adjudicators of the scientific publishing process, like lab heads, journal editors, and reviewers. One, discuss citation diversity as a team. Two, solicit a shared ethics in citational practices as a lab or a journal policy. Three, don't open the gate until the paper has a reference list that the lab or the journal would be proud of. Number four, raise awareness by requiring a citation diversity statement. Number five, explicitly support the work of minority scientists by inviting them to co-author reviews and author invited papers. Number six, assess citation diversity when you perform peer review. And lastly, what about reflectors? These are the people who mirror, reflect, and canvas the scientific field for others. So these are mentors, instructors, and review authors. First, they can commit to offering a balanced view of the field as it stands now, and an increasingly equitable view of the field as it grows. Number two, they can facilitate summer research programs and collaborative research between young 
and established URM scholars. Three, check your syllabi for underrepresentation. Introduce students to relevant URM work. Number four, for review authors, expand your own and others' sense of the field by consciously including and in some cases highlighting work by URM scholars. In addition to those things that each of us can do as we fall into the roles of creators, arbiters, and reflectors, we as a lab and others have begun developing tools um, to help mitigate disparity. The first tool is a citation diversity statement, but there are others as well. So the citation diversity statement was um, developed by Jordan Dworkin, who was the first author and really the lead pioneer thinker in the gender paper. And um, a description of that statement is in the Trends in Cognitive Science paper. In addition, we have software for the gender predictions that you can apply to your reference lists if you'd like to see how your what your balance looks like and if you want to address any imbalance that exists. Um, and that's on GitHub um, and that's from Dale. Jenny uh, has just created and released a citation tra transparency uh, Google Chrome extension. Um, it also uh, works with PubMed as well and it's free on the Chrome Web Store. What it does is allow you to predict the genders of the first and last author of the papers that you see on Google Scholar or on um, PubMed, and that helps you to um, educate yourself on the work of uh, minority thinkers. And last, last Max Berlero has Python code for um, predicting gender, race, and ethnicity, and that's on GitHub under his um, title Balanced Cider. And that's available if you'd like to consider um, applying it to your reference list to understand whether your papers in general have a uh, balance in terms of race and ethnicity as well. He is the first author of the paper, the follow-up paper, evaluating um, racial and ethnic imbalance in citation practices in neuroscience. With that, I'd like to quote Maya Angelou, the truth is no one of us can be free until everybody is free. I think we all have a responsibility to consider the fact that it's time for a state transition in mind. A scientist is not a white, cisgender, heterosexual man. A scientist is anyone who is seeking to understand how the natural world works. Changing the meaning of the word scientist may take some energy, but it's energy that each of us can exert. The, the um, tools that we have created put the power of social justice into the hands of each individual person on this call. With that, I'd like to acknowledge the people who were important um, in the work. Jordan Dworkin is the person who led the gender study. Max Bertolero is the person who is leading the race and ethnic bias uh, imbalance study. Dale created the initial binder to predict gender um, from of reference lists. Uh, Perry Zern is a philosopher at American University who has been extremely important in helping us to contextualize our efforts in the context of current uh, gender and race theory. Jenny. This is just a powerhouse in all kinds of ways, um, but also developed the uh, Citation Transparency Google Chrome extension. Taki and Kristen are biostatisticians uh, who, con who uh, contributed to the first paper in gender. Erin did as well. She's a postdoc in physics. And then um, Tony, Damien, Koff, and Lucina are all collaborators on this paper that hopefully we'll be submitting soon um, on the racial and ethnic imbalance in citation practices. With that, thank you so much for listening, and I'd be very happy to take questions.